Netherlands a very good afternoon and good evening India. Hope everyone is safe during this pandemic. I am Deepthi Shivakumar, first year BCom student, Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. Welcome to 53rd International Webinar of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. At the outset, I am happy to inform you all that our college is celebrating its Golden Jubilee year. On behalf of our college, we congratulate all the stakeholders. Today's webinar is fully hosted by the students of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. I request everyone to kindly pardon us in any case of mistakes. An IQAC initiative in association with Huygens Institute for the History of Netherlands is organizing international webinar on digital humanities session 14. I now request Nagasuda Madam, Assistant Professor, Department of Commerce, to play a small video of our college. Over to you, ma'am. A great journey begins with a small step. Proving this statement true, it all began in 1930 when two women educational enthusiasts took up a noble initiative in the erstwhile posh locality of Sheshadripuram. Srimati Anandamma and Srimati Sitamma started a primary school with 20 children. Now, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust under its umbrella has 36 institutions. It all began with the educational visionary Sri K. M. Nanjappa, the then president of Sheshadripuram Educational Trust in 1971, which has been a landmark in the history of education for the working students by starting Sheshadripuram Evening College. Our college started with the primary objective of imparting formal education to the quality and needy. The college is affiliated to the Bengaluru Central University. Being in the heart of the city, it has an easy reach and connectivity. Its premises comprise of spacious building with good canteen, computerized library, business lab, browsing center, Wi-Fi facility, sports club, thus well equipped for all academic, sports, co-curricular like NSS, NCC, YRC, etc., and extracurricular activities throughout the year. The college organizes orientation program for freshers and guest lecturers to equip them. As most of us are working in the morning and studying in an evening degree college, it is very facilitative for us to excel in our jobs. Even though we are studying in an evening degree college, we are being provided many state level and national level opportunities to express our talents. Also, many cultural activities are being conducted. SEDC is engaged in various cultural activities throughout the year. There are numerous committees in the college that perform variedly on their behalf and have a lasting effect on the college, students as well as outsiders. Our evening degree college believes in the vision to ignite the minds of every student to identify and develop their inner strength with the mission to promote holistic development of students by offering quality education and making them self-reliant and progressive. Our college NCC cadets will visit every academic year in officers training academy in Chennai, the INS Kadamba Naval Base at Karwar. It will motivate our college NCC cadets to join Indian Armed Force. <laughs> Thank you very much, madam. May I now request Sharanya K, first year student, BCom, to welcome and introduce all the dignitaries, dignitaries to this international webinar. Happy evening to India and good afternoon to Netherlands. I am Sharanya K, a first year BCom student of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. I extend a warm welcome to one and all present here. Today, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the 53rd international webinar of our college. At the outset, I would like to thank all the office bearers of this great institution and welcome all of them. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome today's theme speaker, Dr. Ellie Bleeker. 
Ellie Bleeker works as a researcher at the Huygens Institute for the History of Netherlands. She specializes in digital scholarly editing with a focus on modern manuscripts, genetic criticism, and semi-automated collation of liter literary texts. As a, as a research fellow in the Marie Sklodowska Curie Funded Network picks at 2013-17, she received advanced training in manuscript studies, text modeling, and XML technologies for text modeling. She completed her PhD at the Center for Manuscript Genetics at Antwerp University 2017 on the role of the scholarly editor in the digital environment. Currently, she works together with Ronald Hengen Stecker and studies the potential of graph technologies for the modeling of literary and historical texts. This confronts her frequently with complex manuscripts that are very challenging to model computationally. Still, she would choose it again without a doubt. And to ensure others for the researcher Huygens, ING Amsterdam, Netherlands, research field of digital scholarly editing, she set up the companion for digital editing methods together with colleagues, Marijka Van Fasen, Rick Hoekstra, and Marijn Kulin. The companion is an online platform in learning environment for everyone interested in doing digital scholarly editing. Furthermore, Ellie is an associate editor of the journal Variants, board member of the European Society for Textual Scholarship and the DHB Benelux Steering Committee, and she recently became a member of the Society of Dutch Literary Studies. Ma'am, on behalf of Shashadrupuram Educational Trust, I wholeheartedly welcome you to this webinar. It is my proud privilege to welcome and introduce one more distinguished person who is presiding in this web webinar, Sri W.D. Ashok Sir, Honorary Trustee, Shashadrupuram Educational Trust, Bengaluru, India. Sir holds a master's degree in pharmacy, specialized in the field of total parental nutrition. He served at the famous Al Adan Hospital, Kuwait, for over 13 years. He is an honorary trustee of Shashadrupuram Educational Trust. Sir is the backbone for all the events conducted in our evening degree college. Sir, on behalf of Shashadrupuram Evening Degree College, I welcome you and request you to preside over this webinar. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Krishna Swami, sir, trustee of Shishadripuram Educational Trust. Sir, on behalf of Shishadripuram Evening Degree College, I welcome you to this webinar. Welcome, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank I you. Would, I would also like to welcome our beloved principal, Professor N.S. Satish, sir, who is the man of perfection and a guiding force for organizing 52 international webinar conducted so far. Sir, I wholeheartedly welcome you to this webinar. I welcome all the office bearers and trustee of Shashadrupuram Educational Trust and all the principals of our sister institutions, other heads of institutions, conveners, volunteers, and all the participants who have registered across the globe. Now, I welcome Dharapma Kannur sir, program coordinator, and Rajat P.S. sir, IQAC coordinator. And finally, I welcome our own teaching and administrative staff to this webinar. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Sharanya, for welcoming all. May I now request team speaker, Dr. Ellie Bleeker, researcher, Huygens, Amsterdam, Netherlands, to enlighten us on the topic, digital humanities. Over to you, Ma. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone is doing well considering the global pandemic. Um, and um, I hope you're all in good health. I'm uh, extremely pleased and honored to be here and happy to tell you about uh, my digital humanities research. I uh, would like to ask you to save any questions uh, till after my presentation. Um, and please don't hesitate to ask anything you like to know. Um, I hope uh, you enjoy what I would like to tell you. I will now start sharing my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Wonderful, great. So, um, in the digital humanities, there is an ongoing question that uh, concerns the question, do humanist scholars need to learn how to code? Do they simply need to know how to use research software? Or do they really need to be involved in the development of this software? And if so, to what extent? Now, the digital humanities field exists for over 40 years now, if you consider the first humanities computing conference as a start, uh, which happened in uh, 1989. 
and uh, it has really taken flight the last 20 years or so. And I think it's clear to everyone that the field is here to stay. But the answers to the question, do all humanists need to learn to code, um, diverge from faculty to faculty, from researcher to researcher. And it is really important, I think, um, that we decide upon these questions because uh, the answers will impact how we do research, as well as how we shape uh, humanities curricula. For instance, how to include coding skills in a curriculum from a human scholar that is already quite full. Now, in my talk today, I will address these questions by giving a perspective from two digital humanities projects that I currently work on. The first one, is uh, code literacy in the humanities. It is research into the perception of the digital humanities community about the uh, concept of code literacy. And the second project I will talk to, uh, I will talk about is the development of research software for collation of texts. Now, I will first start with a brief introduction, uh, which will give you some context about the type of work I do uh, and the collaborations I am involved in. I have a background in Roman languages and a master's degree in book and digital media studies and a PhD in digital scholarly editing. I currently work at the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands, and I am uh, located at a research group we call Comtes which stands for Computational Modeling of Textual Sources. And my colleagues in this research group are Dr. Marijn Kolen, Dr. Riek Hoekstra, engineer uh, Ronald Heintjes Decker and myself. So we are a very small research group, um, but we have a very broad diversity of expertise. In addition to digital scholarly editing and textual scholarship, we also work on markup technologies, um, this means that we uh, study data models for text, uh, including the syntax, the query languages, the uh, representation of markup and the application of markup to texts. We do digital history and we do computational literary studies. Uh, for example, we have a project in which we try to analyze uh, the perceptions of literature by uh, analyzing the uh, feedback that people give uh, on blogs and online. So if you are looking for um, another contributor to your uh, digital humanities seminars, I can recommend one of my colleagues. So um, now back to uh, the first part, the code literacy in digital humanities. I can say that all of the work we do in the research group Comtas is uh, characterized uh, by um, asking questions like what do we as scholars expect from digital technology and what changes are made by using digital technology are these changes for the better and how can we ensure that digital technology not only supports our research but actually improves our research to some extent that um, we do things we cannot do without technology. Also very important, how can we make sure that the scholars who use these tools in fact understand how the tools operate in order to prevent bias um, and um, in order to prevent uh, a fault analysis of the outcome of a research tool. And finally, how do we teach others and ourselves to become better digital scholars? So the question of code literacy in the humanities is um, around for a long time. And um, we, uh, as a research group, decided to take a survey, to set out a survey in which we studied the different ways in which the digital humanities community understands code literacy, because there is not one definition of code literacy. Um, and we started with this research um, because of a panel at the Digital Humanities Benelux Conference. Benelux stands for Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, which are three very small countries in Northeast Europe. I'm sorry, Northwest Europe. Um, and um, the, the 
theme of the panel was programming humanists. What is the role of coding literacy in digital humanities? And why does it matter? Uh, at the end of the panel, we noticed that the most uh, evidence we had of code literacy was anecdotal. So maybe you recognize this from your own field. Um, that some people say, well, in my department, we do it like this. And another person says, well, by my experience, code literacy is this and this. So there is not one uh, conclusion. And we figured we need to do better than just having anecdotal evidence. Uh, let's make a collective effort in trying to understand how to improve code literacy in the humanities. So uh, we set up an international collective uh, by my colleague Sally Chambers, Liliana Melgar, Kasper Belen, Marijn Kolen and Joris van Sandert and me uh, decided to create a survey and ask the community of digital humanities, what do you think uh, code literacy means? What does it mean for you? And how can we improve it? The survey was designed based on four research questions. The first one was about the definition. The second one was about the importance of digital humanities, uh, of code literacy in digital humanities scholarship. The third one was uh, concerned with the education. How can we teach uh, digital humanities uh, code? And the final one was um, the ways in which scholars can be supported to improve their code literacy. Um, I will get back to this at the end of my lecture, but I am very curious to hear about the way in which Sechadri uh, Purum College uh, approaches these questions. Um, so please keep them in mind. Um, the methodology uh, by which we designed the survey, um, well, it took us about six months uh, to set the survey up. And in those six months, we had about 49 Skype calls because it was during the pandemic and we were collaborating with people in different countries. So we were behind the uh, Skype a lot. <laughs> um, we took on a post positive fist approach, which means that we kept in mind that uh, when we designed the, the survey, we already had some bias um, because all of us have some idea about code literacy and it is inevitable that this idea is present in um, the way we designed the survey. Now we followed the um, uh, GDPR, which is the rules on privacy uh, and the guidelines for handling personal data. And before we send out the survey, we had a pilot in which we tested uh, how it came across. Uh, the survey was distributed via different mailing lists and research institutes, universities and social media. We tried really to reach the whole world. So I am not sure uh, whether you um, maybe have come across this survey, but uh, if not, my apologies. It was intended for literally everyone over the whole wild world doing digital humanities. Um, we uh, assembled 399 responses which is uh, quite a large number. And we were a bit sad that it's not 400 responses, but um, people would not have believed us probably if it was exactly 400. Now I will briefly give um, uh, the results of the survey uh, analysis. So the demographics of the respondents, um, 166 people identified themselves as female, 208 identified themselves as male, and seven uh, people preferred, uh, sorry, seven people gave an other option. And I gave one example of the option, which is um, uh, I'm a nasty woman and I'm proud of it. <laughs> so, uh, and there were 18 people who left the gender question unspecified. Uh, the background of the respondents, you can see here. Um, a large part of almost half of the respondents considered themselves as academics. Um, we also have a significant amount of developer software engineers. And please note that the one does not exclude the other. You can be an academic software engineer. We had librarians, we had students, we had technical staff and support staff, we had archivists, um, etc. And um, from these uh, 
respondents, there were um, a large amount of people with a background in history, as you can see here. We had language and or literary studies, also almost 38%, and library and information science. Now again, um, people can have multiple backgrounds. Uh, for myself, for example, I would be both language and literary studies as well as library and information science. So, um, but you see, we um, we have 11% uh, of computer scientists background. We have 6% of software development. So the, the largest part of the people come from a more humanities background. Uh, the geographical distribution, uh, we had the largest amount of responses from uh, the United States of America, which is interesting because uh, neither of the organizers uh, of the survey are from the US. Also, uh, the Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, um, and as you can see, um, the number of respondents uh, from Europe was the largest, and then we had North America, um, uh, and yeah, so uh, it was quite a uh, um, Western focused survey. Um, now I will look at uh, one research question here, uh, which is the definition of code literacy. Uh, so our research question to remind you was, what are the definitions uh, and interpretations of code literacy across humanities disciplines? And we translated this research question into a question in the survey which was, how would you define code literacy? And please use uh, keywords or phrases or whatever you like. Now we got a lot of different responses because it was an open question. Some people said, I don't know. Other people said, um, the ability to understand and write code. Um, some people were really specific, like the third option uh, I gave here. Uh, they defined a skill of literacy low code literacy and high code literacy. So the lowest, according to this respondent, would be reading and understanding code. And the highest would be creating code and write compilers. Uh, I also liked the response that said, how much coding scares you off? And I assume that this uh, person means that if you are very experienced in code, that you are not scared by it. If you have no experience, you are very scared. But who knows? Maybe if you have no experience, you also don't know what to be afraid of. So uh, we analyze these questions uh, via a qualitative data analysis approach, which means that we did a axial coding in which we uh, all seven of our uh, group um, analyzed the answers individually, and then we uh, cross-checked our answers with each other. And we identified different categories uh, within the definitions given. Um, many people talked about communication. Uh, also, a lot of respondents mentioned contextual understanding. And there were uh, a lot of respondents who talked about these levels of competence, uh, such as the examples I gave before. Uh, also interesting is that uh, respondents often uh, differentiated between uh, programming and encoding. So encoding uh, would be, for instance, uh, creating an XML transcription of a historical document. And programming would be uh, writing a um, program uh, to carry out some task. Um, oh yeah, let me show you on the right side of the slide, you see LOC, which stands for level of competence. And we identified um, seven levels of competence. Uh, the one is considered to be the lowest, which means that you can recognize code when you see it. Number seven is uh, the highest, which means that in addition to being able to write code yourself, you also understand the whole paradigm of uh, coding. Now, if you look at the responses, you can see that um, mostly LOC2 and LOC3 have been used, which means that the most respondents uh, identified uh, code literacy as being able to read and write code. 
Um, there is 19% of the respondents who says, for me, code literacy is just being able to read it. Other people said, no, I'm just right. And also interesting that uh, respondents often talked about uh, programming, processing code, rather than the encoding. Now, if we uh, cross tabulate the um, definitions uh, given by the background of the respondents, we can see that the people who have a background in language and literary studies uh, or in textual scholarship most often use um, LOC2 or LOC3 to define code literacy, which again means um, being able to read or write code. And they also, interestingly, um, for the code type, mostly focus on processing. Whereas you would think that in textual scholarship and digital editing, most people would consider uh, encoding as code. I have here another overview. This is uh, the blue bars are for history, the people with a background in history. And the orange bars are um, people with a background in linguistics. And you can see actually quite similarly that the uh, LOC2 and LOC3 are mostly used to define code literacy. So reading, writing code. And um, what we can do with this data, what we plan to do, uh, is that we take some steps towards providing a definition of code literacy. And by using this definition, we hope that the community of digital humanities will be able to have a very effective and practical discussion about the level of code literacy that is required for digital humanities scholars. Now, 86% of the respondents mentioned something about a level of competence. And 6% uh, actually identified these multiple levels. A lot of people also said that having a contextual understanding is very important. Uh, the, interestingly, the people who mentioned that most uh, said that they had a very uh, advanced background in programming. And um, most people also said that processing or programming was uh, more of a coding thing than encoding text. Uh, also interesting is the question, um, how important do you think code literacy is for digital humanities research? Now, you can see here that um, a lot of respondents <laughs> said that it is crucial so I'm really interested to hear whether you agree or not. And finally, um, this is the last uh, slide with the analysis of the survey. Uh, we asked participants whether or not they were satisfied with their level of code literacy, their personal level. Um, you can see that it's, uh, it's quite evenly distributed. So we have um, a lot of respondents who said that they were dissatisfied or slightly dissatisfied with their level of code literacy. But there were also um, quite a lot of respondents who said that they were somewhat satisfied or satisfied. Um, and we furthermore asked respondents, do you experience any barriers to becoming more code literate if you want to become more code literate? <laughs> As you can see, I hope it's clear on the screen, it's quite light blue, but the largest um, barrier was not enough time. Also, um, I don't know where to get started. Um, people said that uh, they were not confident or that their employer uh, or institute did not provide uh, the right resources. And resources here, you can think of the hardware, no computers, but you can also think of them um, like the software uh, co uh, side, for instance, no training, um, and no, uh, no books, no schooling, etc. Um, many people gave explanations. Um, I have highlighted a few. Um, 
a respondent said, I don't have time because this kind of things is not recognized as part of my job. Another one said that they lack both time and resources. And they also said that when they do have time, they don't have the right equipment. Um, institutions who do not provide the right amount of resources or do not support digital humanities work. Uh, I find this one interesting, uh, last, second to last. It says, I don't know where to get started because there's an overwhelming number of code skills that are used in digital humanities. And uh, this is in a seemingly bewildering way to non-coders. And my employer provides only structured courses to students enrolled in the master's program. Uh, and the final, uh, remark I have highlighted here is that a respondent said, I'm not sure if it is better to invest in learning or in finding a good collaborator. Now, as you can see, oh, pardon me. Um, there's quite a lot to say about the level of code literacy in digital humanities. And I am, again, very curious to hearing your side of the story. Um, but what we noticed already we are still working on the analysis of the results of the survey but what we noticed already is that many people identified um, that they did not know where to start um, and it was found very complicated to uh, single out the right resources the right training what do i need to learn there is so much to learn. Um, do I need to focus on learning a specific uh, language, a programming language? Uh, do I need to learn Python? Or is it better to, um, to focus on working with uh, tools? Or uh, should I try to get this high level understanding of code? There are so many questions and no clear answer. Um, so what we hope to do with the survey is first of all to uh, infer a, um, a vocabulary that is uh, provided by the community of digital uh, humanity scholars. So uh, not a vocabulary that is from um, top down, but a vocabulary that comes from a uh, bottom up. And we hope that this will help discussing uh, code literacy because people would then have the same uh, words um the same language to discuss it and the second one is that we noticed that there were a lot of uh, talk about different levels of code literacy so we thought maybe we can identify the different levels as the skill of proficiency and uh, similar to learning a language you can identify different phases different steps on that skill but again the question is what would be lowest and what would be the additional steps that's quite interesting um, also, of course, uh, there needs to be a lot of collaboration. There needs to be collaboration between humanities researchers and computer scientists, but also between experienced researchers and early career researchers. And this collaboration can take place in the so-called trading zones. Uh, research by Max Kemmon identified uh, specifically trading zones in digital humanities. There's sort of uh, a negotiation between the different cultures um, and this negotiation makes sure that there can be collaboration in which both sides uh, bring their own expertise. Important to uh, achieve such a trading zone is to find a common language. Now, this language develops to some extent naturally. For instance, once you start collaborating with someone who is not from your own discipline, you will start to use or adopt or develop uh, your own ways to describe your methods. Uh, and you will start to use or develop your uh, own terminology. But it is helpful in any case. And this is um, uh, something I will pick up on the second part of my talk to um, have an approach to doing digital humanities research that is uh, driven by a research question, by a research hypothesis or objective. And based on this objective, you can then model your workflow, you know, think about it from a high level. And once you have this high level model of a workflow, 
you can then consider the technology or tools you need for each step in this workflow. After that, you can zoom in even more and you can create a computational pipeline for the several steps, etc. You can think, what tools are already out there? What do I need to develop myself? And can I do that? Uh, if not, maybe I can collaborate with other scholars. So it's a really methodological way of thinking about the research you would like to do. Now, I have already mentioned that our research group, CONTES, consists of researchers with different backgrounds and within our group, collaboration is vital. So the survey I talked about is the product of intense collaboration. In the second part of my talk, I will give an example of how this collaboration takes form in another way. By discussing ongoing research into developing automated collation software. So, um, first, what is collation? I am not entirely sure of your background, so I will explain it briefly. If you have more questions, um, please do let me know. And if this is already familiar to you, my apologies. Collation in this context means simply the comparison of two or more versions of texts. Um, collation literally means placing texts side by side. And um, these versions of a text are usually called a witness, witnesses. Collation or comparing texts is considered a scholarly primitive, uh, which means that it is a basic uh, scholarly activity that is used across different disciplines. Now, you can use collation for uh, several um, objectives. You can use it to establish a critical text. You can use it to get as close to the original text by comparing versions until you are back at the source. You can use it also to um, track or map the development of a literary work. Once the author starts writing, um, he or she usually begins small and then works, elaborates that version and makes revisions and changes and everything. So by comparing these versions, you uh, get insight into development of the text. Uh, collation is very um, uh, well uh, suited for uh, using the computer. Because comparing texts uh, is very uh, repetitive work, you have to focus on the smallest details. So it's, it's something that people cannot do very well, but computers love to do that. So already in the 1960s, um, scholars started to experiment with using software to compare texts. And I really liked the citation by Petty and Gibson in the 1970s, because it explains a lot about um, the, our way of thinking. They write that um, because they find it difficult to communicate with programmers, they decided that they would actually program. They would, they as textual scholars, would um, make decisions and they would be uh, working towards having a software uh, that understands their decisions. So translating their way of thinking as textual scholars to the computer. Uh, and another interesting citation is by Peter Robinson in the 1980s. And he said that I found myself rethinking some fundamental notions, fundamental notions of textual criticism. So by trying to translate your notions, your ideas, your decision-making process to a uh, machine, you are actually really confronted with them and you have to rethink them. Is this what I mean? Is this what I want? What do I want? Why do I want it, etc. So it's a very useful iterative process. Now there are several collation tools at the moment. You have Collate X, uh, which is created by my colleague, Ronald Heintjes Decker, and very widely used. Um, there is two step or TX step. There is a, a version, a multi version document uh, model, and there's TI comparator, etc. Now, um, remember what I said at the end of the first part 
about first thinking about your research from a higher level perspective, model your workflow. This is what I have done for digital scholarly editing. I have made a model of a standard workflow. Now, this is not a model that every digital editor follows or may leave out stuff or um, do, do stuff in a different order. It is also not a linear workflow, so it is more of a repetitive one, but still it helps us to look at this from a more abstract perspective. So on the upper layer, we have the intellectual activities. Um, that is what happens in the head of a scholar, so to speak. And you can see here that the research objectives and research questions. In the middle layer, we have the actions. Uh, and then we have on the bottom layer, we have the product uh, that comes out of the action. So if we start here, a scholar begins with a research perspective. Maybe you are interested in um, modern manuscripts, trying to trace the development of a literary work. Based, with, based on that research objective, you select text, you select sources, you model them, um, then you digitize them. And the outcomes is maybe uh, facsimiles with metadata. Then you start encoding them. Um, you create a transcription, uh, you annotate the transcription, maybe you link it to other texts. And then here in this part, we have the analysis uh, step, the analysis component of the workflow. And collating is part of the analysis component. And the outcome of the analysis is a selection of the information in the transcription. And then finally, you want to represent your result. So let's focus on this step, on collating. Can we zoom in more? Let's make a workflow now of collation. Actually, this has already been done in 2009 by a collaboration of scholars who came together uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden, which is why the model is called the Gothenburg model. And their model of collation is, uh, consists of five steps. We have tokenization, then we have normalization, then we align the tokens, then there is an analysis of the alignment, and then we visualize the output. Once more, this model is not linear per se. So for instance, you can skip the normalization part and go right from creating tokens from your text to aligning the tokens. You can also adjust the alignment process after you have analyzed the results. But basically this model has been used to build research software for collating texts. Um, Actually, there are three tools for collating that are built based on the Gutenberg model, CollateX, TXStep, and Juxta. Juxta has unfortunately been discontinued because of um, authorial rights, but uh, the other two are still available and they have made their decision process uh, also available for study. So uh, how can we use collation to make digital scholarly editions? Now, digital scholarly editions are online representations of a text. And sometimes there's just one version of a text, but in other cases, there are multiple versions. And that is really interesting. On the left, you see an example of the Samuel Beckett Digital Manuscript Project. Samuel Beckett is a, an author um, from the 20th century in Ireland. And he has created lots and lots of different uh, books and uh, plays. And of all these different books and plays, there are several versions. So if you map all these versions, you can really see the development of the text. You can see how Beckett thinks and how he creates. And the Samuel Beckett Digital Manuscript Project digitizes and transcribes all of these texts and then compares them. And they have built in Collate, Collate X, to compare the different versions. You can see here on the left side, a screenshot of, a, of the output from a collation. In this case, there are four, no, sorry, five versions of, um, yeah, five versions of the text. 
Uh, and if you read this from left to right, you can see here the upper layer is version one and the second layer is version two. Uh, what is green is similar, but you can see that from version one to version two, Beckett changed the word and into the word or. Well, these are small details, um, but the great thing is that uh, Colette X uh, provides these uh, results within milliseconds. And if human beings have to do this work, it takes hours. <laughs> Another example is the Digital Thoreau of Fluid Text Edition. This is a work by um, Thoreau, uh, um, uh, an F American writer who um, created one work called Walden about, uh, well, wandering in the forest. And this is another way to visualize the differences between the versions. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you have to read from top to bottom. You can see in this side, one version, and here you see another version. And in the left panel, you see the amount of available versions. Now there are many, many more examples, but I will focus on these two. So um, we have collation. We have uh, collation as a, there are tools to do it. So are we done now? No, we are not. In the final part of my talk, I will briefly illustrate a little bit of our ongoing research into collation. What we want to do is improve the current collation software. And as, as I said, my colleague Ronald Heintjes Decker is the main developer of Collate X. So we used the code of Collate X to improve it, to do more. One thing is that we would like uh, to collate multiple witnesses at the same time, uh, so multiple versions, and to be able to um, get a, the same output, no matter the order in which you uh, present the different versions to the tool. Unfortunately, at the moment, for every tool out there, it matters in which the, the, the order in which you present the versions. Um, so we would like to uh, improve that. And Ronald is uh, studying ways to do that uh, by using machine learning to train language models to predict better alignments. Uh, a second way in which we want to improve the collation software is by including the revisions inside one version so that we get a more detailed overview of all the different steps in the creation process of a text. Now, most transcriptions of these versions are made in XML. So if we want to compare them, we have to compare XML documents. And these documents are text centric, which means that it's really difficult to compare them because you do not necessarily compare structured trees, but you compare a combination of structured and unstructured data. And furthermore, you would like to see the differences in both the text and the structure. So it's quite a complicated undertaking. I will give a brief example of why this is so interesting to work on and why it teaches us so much about the way we think about text. Here you see a variety of modern manuscripts. And these are all from different writers' archives. So these represent their way of thinking, uh, the notes they took when they were creating a new literary work. Uh, you can see that they uh, made little doodles, that they used different colors to scratch out certain parts, that they used um, different paper, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of information there related to the development of a literary work. And um, <laughs> here you see another example of such a draft manuscript that has a lot of internal revisions. So this is the manuscript of a small literary book by uh, Raymond Brulé. And you can see that Raymond Brulé made some notes in the margin that he crossed out words and um, wrote other words in between the lines. And so, so there's a lot of things going on this page. And you can say that there are multiple dimensions. So you have the first layer of his writing, and then he pauses and he changes the text and he um, starts writing again and then he goes back to something he wrote before so 
it's a it's a chronological process, but it's also a um, creative process, and it's it's quite interesting. Uh, you can try to transcribe what happens on this page in XML. Um, but you can see that the XML tree that results from this transcription, I've just given a really basic transcription, is already quite complex. Um, here you see that the um, word text is um, embedded in a deletion, a del element, an addition, and in an ed. so there's a lot of uh, uh, complexity uh, going on at the page. And you sort of have to reduce the complexity of this page, of the manuscript page, uh, when you make an XML transcription. But at the same time, you would like to keep the complexity because the complexity is part of the, uh, of the, of the process of the author. So our research question, and remember I said that um, it is important to always start your research um, by having one or more research questions or objectives. Our research objective was to create a collation tool that is able to take the XML transcriptions and takes into account this multidimensionality uh, of the manuscript page, which means that uh, the XML, uh, sorry, the collation tool needs to recognize the different uh, sites, the different places of revision within one XML transcription and that it should make similar decisions as a human does. So to recap, we would like a collation tool that recognizes nonlinear text. So linear is just one sequence. And as you saw in the manuscript, it's definitely not linear. Uh, our definition of linear is uh, that there are multiple ways of reading the text. So in this case, you can read it from left to right, but you can also include the interlinear additions. Um, and when you divide the text into smaller parts and start to align them, you need to take into account that at some point the text is not linear. So it means that there are different paths, different ways of reading the text. And the collation tool, we would like it to take into account these different parts. So we developed Hypercollate, and it is based on the code of Collate X, but it is able to compare XML documents that are text-centric. It uses a graph data model, and uh, it is able to recognize the points in the transcription where the text is nonlinear. It recognizes the tag, the XML tag subst, and subst stands for substitution. It also recognizes the XML tag app, which means that it's, an, uh, it's, it's XML speak for uh, letting the computer know that here starts a different uh, uh, reading of the text. And this means that the input witnesses, so the different versions you give to the tool, are not considered as a linear sequence of text. It's not a linear sequence of characters, but it's considered partially ordered. And Hypercollate, the tool, it will find the best uh, matches between the different branches or paths through the text. And the output will be a uh, collation uh, result. So it's really complex if you don't have a, an example. So here we have two versions of another manuscript text. Uh, it's almost, it's very difficult to read. So I made an easy transcription. It's in French. Uh, it says, Depuis 20 novembre, sa famille attendait avec l'impatience. Well, so you see that there are a few words crossed out. There are a few words that are added uh, between the lines of the text. And uh, even those are crossed out and added again. So there's a lot happening here. On the other side, version B, that's the published version of the text. So um, it's linear, linear text, and you can see that the author uh, chose the words attendez avec l'impatience, which he crossed out in the manuscript. He chose them again in the um, uh, outcome uh, in, the, in the print publication. So the author was writing, he found uh, a nice phrase, 
he decided not to use the phrase, he crossed it out. And then once the manuscript got to the printing press, he decided to go back to the original version. So as a human scholar, I would really like uh, to notice that. But if I use a regular collation tool, I would not be able to, um, uh, to include this multidimensionality. I would have to make the text linear. Um, so I would have to probably choose one, um, uh, I would probably choose the deletion uh, to leave out the deletion and go with um, only the addition. Um, but with hypercollate, I'm able to encode the text like this in XML, and I will uh, use the substs element here and here uh, to mark this revision. And within the subst element, I have indicated that the words attendez avec l'impatience are deleted, and that the word aspirer is added and then deleted again. <laughs> So you see, I have used XML to really go on a micro detail level of the uh, manuscript and encode all of the um, revision. So I would really like hypercollate to recognize this revision side and see, consider it as different uh, parts through the text. So this is a visualization of the way uh, the XML transcription is understood by hypercollate. You can see it's a variant graph, which means that you um, read from left to right. And at the moment where a variation occurs in the text, the graph splits into two. And you can see the node here. It, uh, there's a branch going to this part, and there is a branch that reads like this. So you can read it. You can read through two versions of the text. And the colored blocks are used to indicate that the text is marked up, the XML element. So you can see here in the visualization that hypercollate knows that this word, aspire ver, is uh, tagged in XML with an add element, but also in a subst element, and that it is everything is part of the XML element, as you can see here. But the main thing I would like you to keep in mind is that hypercollate is able to consider a text not as a linear sequence, but as a, um, as a graph uh, with multiple parts. And here you see the results. By comparing version A with version B, um, you can see here the result in an alignment table presented. So the matching text is in the same cells. And here you see that the words uh, attendez avec are aligned with the attendez avec in version B. And normally in uh, other collation tools, this would not be the case. So there's still a lot of work to do on hypercollate. I gave you a really small detail of one sentence, but you already saw larger manuscripts with many more transcriptions uh, and revisions. So you can imagine the complexity of um, uh, the complexity that a tool needs to handle. It is also difficult to visualize this complexity. I have now shown you an alignment table in which the two versions are aligned one on top of the other. But I've also shown you a variant graph with colored blocks. And I really wonder, is this informative for many people apart from the people who create the tool? I understand it because I was involved in the creation of the tool, but it is my goal, goal to create a visualization that is understandable for a lot of people. But it's really difficult to visualize that complexity. Um, and it is also very computationally expensive to create, uh, to compare large amounts of texts on all these different levels. So you can see here that we have published a lot of uh, work on it. 
already and we continue working on it but i wanted to give you an insight not necessarily to present to you a finalized tool but rather to illuminate um, our requirements and how these requirements inform our decisions in creating software so concluding remarks i would like to conclude with a quote by nancy ike that she gave uh, already in 1987 and her, uh, to her, the question was asked, do you think that human, humanists need to learn to program? And she said, no, but experience with computer programming, it provides you with a fundamental understanding of the concepts, the principles, etc. cetera. Um, it will help you to grasp the way uh, information is stored and accessed and manipulated. And this, I hope I have illustrated a bit by describing the different ways in which we uh, store text. We can either store text just in plain text format, we can store it as an XML document, we can store it as a variant graph. And all of these different ways give us, us different tools to manipulate it. So my advice to you, if you want to learn uh, to do <laughs> digital humanities better, always consider the hidden or not hidden assumptions behind the tools and software you use so that makes that means that you have to question what your tool does and what it doesn't do and why and do you agree with the decisions that are built inside the tool and do these decisions align with your own research goals or not and if you cannot code do collaborate find this abstract level of thinking about your research question think about the way you can model your research flow and this already will give you a lot of um, uh, shared vocabulary to collaborate with people who can probably code a bit better but do not have your domain expertise so the three c's cannot code collaborate um, and I have some discussion points uh, I would like to hear your opinion about, like I already mentioned at the beginning. I would love to hear your ideas about code literacy in digital humanities. Uh, I would also like to hear what you think should be a part of code literacy in the training of digital humanities and how you would like to learn yourself and whether you collaborate and if so, how do you do it? But I will now, um, cease my presentation and thank you very very much for listening um and again it has been my honor to be invited here thank you very much thank you thank you very much madam for your insightful theme address now the floor is open for the interaction we will take up questions which we have received from the chat box and the registration form I request Vinay Sagar, sir, to moderate the interaction session. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Deepthi. Uh, uh, the question, uh, ma'am, can I start up with the question? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, what kind of interdisciplinary support do you expect to digital humanities? Thank you for this question. Um, Madam, you can stop sharing this screen. So thank you very much for asking the question about interdisciplinary support. It is a very important part of digital humanities research. Uh, and I think that in many cases, institutes and in universities have not sufficiently provided this support even though they, um, they state that they value interdisciplinary work. So what I would expect is um, maybe a appreciation of um, having publications that are written by multiple authors. This is already the case in the hard sciences, but in the humanities, single author publications are still the rule. And the more authors you have on the publication, the less value your publication has. 
I do not agree with that. I have shown you two different types of research projects that are the result of collaboration. And I find it um, incredibly important, if not crucial for digital humanities research. Another way in which I think um, interdisciplinary collaboration can be supported is by accepting uh, more output than just publications. So I have uh, collaborated with Ronald Heintjes Decker to develop Hypercollate, but my institute does not necessarily um, accept a software as a academic publication. If if you they don't they uh, they are very happy with the fact that this software is developed, but they do not consider it uh, of the same level as a research publication. So we have to write papers and articles about our software, which we happily do, but it would be really nice if software would also be considered a, um, a valuable publication. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mom, next question. Uh, sir, sir, sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Ma'am, do you recommend code literacy and digital humanities for undergraduate level? Thank you for the question. Yes, I do. Um, I recommend that students uh, at undergraduate level also start learning how to code. I do think it is not easy to say what they should learn. I think this depends on the type of um, discipline. I think that if you are a linguist, there are other tools and other software to learn um, than if you are a historian. So it is up to us to develop different types of curricula. But I do think you cannot start soon enough with learning a little bit to code. Thank you. Uh, 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 Mama, one more question is, Mama, why is it made complicated in digital humanities by using coding language? Mm. It is difficult to um, publish research that is completely that consists completely of code, because um, digital humanists usually um, decide for themselves what type of coding language they like to write in, and this is perfectly fine. Uh, some people prefer Python, other people use R or JavaScript or uh, Kotlin. Um, the downside is that uh, it is hard to review someone else's code, especially if you are not a trained software developer, but a humanist scholar who knows how to code, but who is not able to create beautiful, logical code. Um, humanist scholars uh, who have learned how to code can probably um, improve their coding if they uh, improve the, the look of their coding and the way in which their coding can be reviewed. But they have very little time and they probably are happy as it is. It makes it hard to review uh, software as a scholarly output because um, everyone uses different languages and uses different coding paradigms. So I would advise that um, in addition to publishing research software, you also publish a very extensive and very clear documentation and maybe put more effort in the documentation than one would do if it was just uh, for software development. Because you would like your documentation to be readable by people from different backgrounds um, who are, um, not necessarily very code literate, so that they are at least able to understand what decisions you made and what your tool does. Uh, this is my recommendation, but I think that this is the reason also why it is very difficult to um, use code in digital humanities as a scholarly output. I hope this answers your question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hello, sir. Can you please ask questions? Um, uh, madam, 
do you think that the fund is sufficient to dh research unfortunately not <laughs> it it may depend in which country you are um i know that in the netherlands and in belgium we do have trouble to find funding for digital humanities uh we usually have to select a traditional humanities discipline for instance history or literature studies and then add a digital humanities component but the funding schemes for collaborative digital humanities research in the netherlands are insufficient i am not aware uh, of the policies in other countries um how is it with you do you think that there is sufficient funding for digital humanities Okay. Here it's in a very early stages, madam. Still, it's not being uh, carried out in a much bigger way. It's still in the sorry to early hear. stages, child childhood stage. Ah, I'm sorry to hear, but it's very great that you are doing this because uh, with this seminar, you are creating uh, platforms for collaboration and knowledge exchange. And I think this is a start. Uh, Ma'am, and the last question for the day is, uh, Ma'am, is it necessary to learn these coding languages uh, in, a, in a must way? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I think it is necessary to learn the basics of one coding language and to learn it in such a way that you understand the computational way of thinking. Um, if you take a regular Python course, you will probably learn the syntax rather than uh, the computational way of thinking you need for digital humanities. So I would advise you, um, and if you like, I can uh, share some links to uh, resources in my slides to find uh, digital humanities programming courses for uh, research. Uh, because these courses, in addition to learning syntax, they also teach you how to, uh, how to think, how to think in steps, how to divide your uh, research problem into smaller steps, and how to write software uh, for each of these smaller steps. So, um, I think that is more important to know than to be a master in Python. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, th thank you, ma'am. Uh, my uh, next question uh, is... Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. sir. Uh, sorry, as we are running out of time, can we conclude the Q&A session here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With your permission, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ali, ma'am, for answering the questions. Uh, over to the please. This is all from the Q&A session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Edmund speakers and madam for answering the questions of the participants. A small announcement before presidential address. We will send the feedback form link now in the chat box as well as to your registered email ID which will be active for the next 48 hours. Kindly fill the same and send back for e-certificate. The e-certificates will reach you from seven to 10 days. I now request Shri W.D. Ashok Sir, Honorary Trustee, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust to render presidential remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Good evening and good afternoon to you, madam from Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College in association with the Department of English in association with Eigen's Institute for the History of Netherlands. This international webinar has been done very well by Dr. Ellie Baker to assist or advance computational methods for textual scholarship. The subject matter was discussed in a very well authenticated way by Dr. Ellie. So just I just want to brief it up just uh, by defining that textual scholarship is uh, investigation or transcription, editing, and presentation of text of one sort or the other. 
so just basically i have just told it in a very simple way i did not i cannot complicate it much so that it will be much more easily understood the historical roots of textual scholarship date back to 3rd century bc when the scholarly activities of copying comparing describing and archiving text became professional in the library of alexandria where it started so with this uh, first uh, initial approaches the digital humanities picked up and just to say that how the disciplines of textual scholarship includes what are they including in the textual scholarship i just want to mention that is textual criticism that is also paleography genetic criticism bibliography and history of text or books or textual scholars have been described and also it gives an a uh, procedure of enumerating bibliograph descriptive analytic and also historical bibliography has been described textual editors and annotators cumulatively and collectively and some disciplines of textual scholars focus on certain material sources or text generic such as epigraphy codeology and diplomatic so some of these things are very complicated which has to be much more simplified so just madam has also told about college and how it has to be transformed into simpler way and the basic necessity of coding which is very much necessary for making up digital humanities into much more better way and also madam said about archiving that is in the last sessions also in our session uh, 13 and 12 we saw that how archiving are being carried out that is uh, copying whatever means of a physical document either by photography or photograph are also leads to certain loss of quality in the material so we go for digitalization but at the same time what are the core technology challenges which are ahead once the digitalization has been done also nobody cares because most of the literature people don't understand the computer knowledge so literary is just just make up the volume and they try to store it but how it is being stored or how it is being managed they forget about it so core technology challenges redundancy accessibility renewal and depletion are to be taken care of the first one redundancy computer data is stored in compressed magnetic disk eventually wears out so repeated copying and locating these copies is difficult different and at the same time difficult difficult insights is essentially to be noted so what has happened is this whatever has been created has to be stored at the same time and that has to be located at different stages for example you have prepared something in 2000 after 20 years 2020 it the software has changed and how it has to be taken up nobody bothers about it later on because by that time softwares have been changed and at the same time the data which has been stored there has to be brought up into newer digital digital methods so next is accessibility what i told the point of creating the archives is to ensure that the data is accessible to the scholars when the archives are to be retrieved this data will be dependent on how the data is coded and stored the compatibility of the software also becomes very much necessary what the software was there in 2000 it's not in 2020 now so changes have taken place and it is very necessary for academicians to note that upgradation of softwares or upgradation of their own thesis works or literature works have to be upgraded at the same time this is about what i have just told you is about the literature and the storage and the computer aspect but the other point which is much more is a difficult thing is renewal and depreciation hardware wears out domain names are not purchased for example in your regular way for example you have a house you have purchased a house so it is yours for example if you have leased a house it is not yours you have just leased it for some period of time but at the same time it has to be renewed for you to say that it is yours the same thing is happening for this domain names once they have stored the domain names they are not going to 
see that it is renewed or lease is continued again and again. So software changes, technology changes to be collaborated and has to be upgraded at at least minimum time frame works have to be noted. And I just want to give one of the simple software. They say it as Omeka, O-M-E-K-A, which is a free software, open source content manage, management system for online digital collections. As a web application, it allows users to publish and exhibit cultural heritage objects and extend its fundamentality with themes and plugins. So Omeka, it allows you to just for the basic people who want to see that they start up with some of these aspects of cultural heritage, like archiving, storing, and other aspects can be done using this uh, application. So I just want to thank Dr. Eli to briefing up with the new technology, the coding and college and bringing the linear uh, sites of how it can be formed. It is a very difficult thing for us. Many of us are not uh, in this field at all. It has to be taken up and we have to understand it. Thanks for a great uh, uh, compilation of today's international webinar. Thanks once again for the coordinators and uh, Satish sir who has brought about this wonderful platform and completing with the digital humanities of 14 sessions from different countries he has brought it up. And thanks to the coordinators, Rajas sir, uh, uh, then also other uh, students who have also compiled this whole session. Thank you one and all for this session. Thank you so much, sir, for the presidential remarks. I request Sanjana, I am student of first year BCom, to deliver a word of thanks. Over to you, Sanjana. Thank you, Deepthi. Good evening, one and all. Myself, M. Sanjana, a first year BCom student of Sheshadipuram Evening Degree College. It is my proud privilege to pro propose a word of thanks on behalf of Sheshadipuram Evening Degree College on this occasion. At the outset, I thank Huygens Institute for the History of Netherlands for associating with us to conduct this international webinar. I would like to express a sincere gratitude to Dr. Ellie Bleeker, researcher, Huygens Amsterdam, Netherlands, for presenting an interesting theme talk on realizing the critical digital humanities. I'm humbled and grateful to you, ma'am. I express a sincere thanks to Sri W.D. Ashok, sir, honorary trustee, Shashadripuram Educational Trust, and Krishna Swami sir, Honorary Trustee, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust, rendering the presentation, presidential remarks. Thank you so much, sir. My special thanks to our beloved young and energetic principal, Professor N.S. Sati, sir, who is the robust of our Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. Thank you, sir. My special thanks to our beloved young... I would like to thank Dhirappa Konnu, sir, Program Coordinator, Rajat, sir, coordinator IQAC who have helped us to materialize this webinar. I express a gratitude to all the principals, conveners and members of our sister institutes and other colleges, academicians, research scholars, students and delegates across the globe for presenting this webinar. I would like to convey our heartfelt gratitude to Shishadripuram in Hindi College for giving us the students this special opportunity to host this international webinar. We will ever remain grateful to our teaching and administrative staff for their support. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Sanjana. Very shortly, we will meet up in one more international webinar on June 4th, 2021, conducted by Canada Department. Once again, thank you all for being a part of this webinar. Principal, sir, can we conclude the webinar? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for joining with us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok, sir.